Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to our second Women in Media Leadership Series. I'm thrilled to see you all at this time when we've got a lot of classes going on. Um, I thought that this would be a really interesting moment to be able to move from our opening session on women in uh, leadership with uh, an outgoing governor, the first woman governor in the state, but a woman who was taking on a different phase of her life. And today we're going to focus on a woman who's really on the cusp of a major career, Kayla Tavshin. Um, in almost only five years in May, so less than five years since she graduated from UNC, Kayla has bagged some of the most impressive jobs in broadcasting, and she's known for her seriousness and her substance. She commits news, as some people like to say. She debuts scoops, and she conveys analysis and the importance of the economic generations that are going on in this country and abroad. She is currently at CNBC, and besides making business headlines every day, the, the brass is making sure that Kayla has an array of opportunities and experiences that will deepen her reporting and give her real good live broadcasting experience. That includes disasters. So she spent Sandy, as it came up the East Coast and went through New Jersey with a bang, as you all know, she was in a hotel in New Jersey. You're just getting the whole experience. Uh, Kayla has worked in New York and London since her days here at UNC. She has worked for Bloomberg and the Financial Times. She left school with a lot of skills, but a real important uh, different emphasis. She understood financial markets, and she understood business. She was a star student here at UNC and boasts a joint degree. I'm not going to give her um, transcript, however. Um, she has a joint degree in uh, journalism and international studies, and she also walked out with a certificate in business news, Carolina Business News. She was a prestigious steamboat scholar, and she won the Emil Fisher Scholarship. She spent a, a semester abroad in Brussels, and that made a big difference because while she was there, she also had an internship that was part of the program. She worked for AP, and she covered all sorts of big economic stories during that time. She got some clips, and she got that itch to be a big-time journalist and came back here very focused on what she wanted to do. She grew up in the town of Atlanta. We have a lot to learn about Kaylin. I've let her tell us her story herself. Uh, we had a terrific dinner with her last night, about 10 students, two of which you're going to meet because they're part of our interview group today. Um, and, uh, but I, and I'm going to introduce you, but first I want to introduce you to Penny Abernathy, who is the Knight Professor of Digital Journalism and Economics. She is helping to shape, document, and really define the future of journalism in the digital age. She also spent a lot of time in New York City in that financial world. She was an executive at the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Harvard Business Review. She also teaches one of the most sought-after classes here on leadership. So it seemed apt that she be on the grilling panel. It's going to be an easy grill. Um, also is Seife Yamakapai. She is a senior in electronic communications track. She's working full-time for Carolina Week in Sports Extra. It fits in a few courses along, uh, other classes in there. She does it all, reporting, anchoring, and directing some of the school's broadcasts. She's an enthusiastic newswoman already, and she is looking for her ticket for that next step in her career. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex Risk is a junior, so she's got a little time here. Um, she's majoring in electronic communications as well. She's been on the front lines of Carolina Connection, producing sometimes two or three stories a week for the radio program. She's interviewed everyone from Chancellor Thorpe when he announced his resignation to World War II veterans about uh, their veterans' experience. Um, she interned at Fox News on the West Coast and has a year to figure out her next move. Uh, so first, we're just going to hear from Kay a little bit um, to kind of give us a little bit of a sense of what UNC meant for her and, and how she thinks about leadership as well. And we'll do the question. Thank questioning. you, Dean King. It feels very otherworldly to be here because I feel like it was just yesterday that I was... Yeah, showing up late, running into an exam, <laughs> underprepared, um, and wearing as, as well prepared as you could be, wearing sweats, <laughs> the whole nine yards, um, and in a very short time, and getting to be back here to speak to all of you guys. I see a lot of familiar faces. My thesis advisor, Rhonda Gibson, and Louise Spieler, who I've gotten to know over my, my time in my career. But thank you guys all for being here. I really appreciate it. And I honestly don't feel like I have enough to say to justify a crowd like this, because I literally was here yesterday, but I did get 
the real world training of working in the journalism school, which is just so first class. I mean, I don't think that you really realize what type of training you're getting until you go into the real world and you see people learning how to do stuff that you already know how to do, and it gives you such a leg up on you know, getting to go chase the story and getting to focus on the content of where you're working and what you're doing because you don't have to spend the time learning the nuts and bolts of how to actually produce a story. You've already gotten that covered. And I don't know what many of you want to do. I certainly knew from a very early point in my time at Carolina that I wanted to do business. Dean King mentioned that I was in Brussels and I had this internship with the Associated Press. I was very into politics. I had this dream of being a diplomat, going into the Foreign Service. I had a, a great aunt who was an ambassador, and she worked in, in the Foreign Service in various roles in various cities, and I had always strived to do what she did. Unfortunately, when I went to Brussels, my placement was on the other side of it. So instead of working with the diplomats and the policymakers, I was covering them. And I thought, well, this is going to be horrible. And it ended up being the best thing I could have ever done because instead of working in a back office, being someone's assistant, being someone's researcher, I actually got to be the one on deadline interviewing the person that I would have been working for five people removed. So that was the coolest experience. At the time, it was the five-year anniversary of the euro, the joint currency of all the 27 nations that are in the EU, and I got to do a project with one of the senior writers at the AP on the Euro and how it was, at that time, a very good thing for Europe. Now, of course, the tides have turned a little bit, and it's interesting to think about the way that the, the countries were thinking of it then and the way that they're thinking of it now. Um, but Professor Rausch, Chris Rausch, in the business journalism program, sent me an email and said, you know, you've gotten to do some absurd things while you're in Brussels, not least of which covering parts of the, the business community in Brussels, and he said, why don't you take my economics reporting class? We visited this <laughs> blog post last night, of course. Chris writes a blog, Talking Biz News, and at the time, I should have exercised a little bit more discretion and said maybe that wasn't on the record, but now this lives in <laughs> infamy. And on his blog, one of the very first posts was convincing a student to take economics reporting. And I said to him, as dismal as that class sounds, it would be a useful class to have under my belt, I guess. Just please promise me that I don't have to make any trips to town hall. I would probably hate that more than I hate reading stock indices, and that's saying a whole lot. And now, of course, I read stock tickers for a living, so the joke is on me, definitely. But I took his class, and I really fell in love with, um, with the numbers, with business, the fact that um, it's still, at the end of the day, a human story. There's still a person running that company. There are still people who are turning the wheels, who are crunching the numbers, who are making things work. And because of that, there's always going to be human error. And that's what creates the stories in the business world, is where people mess up, where they do things right, and what that means for um, the overall machine of the American and the global economy. So I got to learn that from a very early, early age here at UNC, and I really attribute my education here to being able to propel me to um, where I eventually got to. Uh, the other thing is, your first job is not your last job. And I took a very, what I thought was a small job based on my greater ambitions. When I first got out of school, it was at a tiny investor newsletter under the umbrella of the Financial Times. I was covering mergers and acquisitions. We had about 200 subscribers. Most of them were hedge funds. And so we were covering these very wonky topics that were niche for this very small audience. and. I thought, you know, I'm going to die here. I'm going to die in this back office. No one's going to ever have read what I wrote um, or what I did. And then you come across a big story. It always happens. Um, you just have to know where to look for it and where to find it. And I found one in uh, Kraft, the macaroni and cheese company, buying <laughs> Cadbury, which is the chocolate egg company, which where could there ever be a better story? Macaroni and cheese and chocolate combining forces. I mean, it was brilliant. So um, I was able to break that story, and, and CNBC, where I work now, um, said, well, we need to get this reporter, thinking probably that I was much older, um, we need to get this reporter on camera. And so when they called, my boss agreed, and they let me go on and talk about it. All the producers at CNBC were like, this is... This is the person that, that we asked for. Are you sure? Is this their assistant? Is this, you know, who is this 16-year-old that we have on our air right now? And, and you know, it, it was funny at the time to think, I think I was 22 or 23, and sitting there getting to be on, on global television. I never could have dreamed that. And I, unfortunately, did not plan for that because I didn't take many broadcast classes here at UNC. I took 
one um, voice and diction class and just let's just say it wasn't my best class here um, and I just I wasn't into the broadcasting but what I was into is the business and you can find any story that any any beat any topic any industry that really drives you and that will make you the most motivated and most focused employee in any career that you want to operate in on the side of being a woman in this industry at UNC, we have it pretty good because when I was here, it was 70 30. Mm -hmm. I understand it's more 60 40 now. Right. So, you know, the scales are tipping back in the right direction. But when women are in charge, when women are the majority, things sort of revolve around you. Mm -hmm. And in the journalism school, especially, I think it was 80% female when I was here. Um, mm -hmm. It was just at that time, five short years ago, it was just a, a calling that I think more women felt called to at that time. So we never felt like we were out of place. We never felt like we were underserved. But now I work on Wall Street, which is not 70-30, to say the least. In fact, it's probably the exact other direction. And so figuring out how to establish yourself as a young woman, put your foot down, make a mark, and get people to take you seriously, I think is an important conversation to have. Not everyone's going to go from the extreme of being at UNC to, you know, working on Wall Street with a bunch of pinstripe suits, but there will be a different balance wherever you are, so it is an important conversation to have. I'm happy to be here. There's nothing like Chapel Hill, even in February. <laughs> April would have been great, too, yeah. but, you know, that's fine. Well, we got the daffodils for you, but nothing else is cooperated, although yesterday was pretty nice. She's also a marathoner and did quite a few um, miles yesterday. Just for, well, the weather was up. too good not to. Did not. So. <laughs> Let's go back to that sort of sense of what you just said, I mean, to be a significant sort of player and be substantial. You said you had an aunt who was in diplomacy, so that kind of gave you an idea, gee, you know, I can go in this field. But what was it, what gave you that sense that you wanted to carve out a public life, like you wanted to go in some place that was, you know, high profile, with a spotlight on it, and make a difference? Can you, what, you came with that kind of sense of yourself to the school, I would imagine. I did, and I, I'm not really sure how it was cultivated. I, from a young age, um, I just was really into reading. I loved history. I loved biographies. I just loved reading about people, and I loved reading about great people and the things that they did. And so when, um, when I came to UNC, my great aunt at the time was, um, she was my only relative living in North Carolina, and um, my family's from Georgia. And so my family said, well, I guess she has to be your emergency contact because she's your, your closest relative. So I put her down at the beginning of freshman year, and then she was very old. I think she was in her 90s at the time. And so um, because I was her only family member in North Carolina, I was her emergency contact. <laughs> so my parents said, why don't you get to know her? You should drive, swing through Asheville on your way back home. And so I would stop through and get to know her. And just hearing about the life that she had was unbelievable. Being in Rome under Kennedy, she worked in the Czech Republic during the peaceful breakup of uh, Czechoslovakia. She had some unbelievable experiences, and I thought, how do I get there? What do I get to do to get there? And that was where it really all started. And uh, uh, Kayla, I, I wanted to uh, look back again when you were talking about the difference between when you were here uh, and then going into Wall Street. So you were saying it was 80% female. It was the exact opposite when I was here in the 70s. It was 20% uh, female here. So in a, in a funny sort of way, it prepared me to go into an all-male world. The disadvantage is business reporting in the 70s was the low end of the totem pole. It was like where you retired after the city desk or uh, you were pushed off into the business uh, world. And it was only beginning to get better in the 80s. I think the stock market crash of the 80s really brought a, a, a group of people forward. But it's mostly brought forward men, young men. So, you know, if, if you were, it, when I graduated here, you tended to latch on to the few female role models you had out there. And one of them was Bonnie Angelo at the time, and so you, you t tended to gravitate toward politics. Mm -hmm. You've gotten, in the last 10 years, you've gotten a whole group of uh, people in the uh, business world who are women, who are both in broadcast and in writing. Who do you see as your role models? Is it Maria Bartiroma? Is it... Is it the group of money honeys that went before you? Uh, and what did they give you that you, you got, uh, that, you know, because everybody who goes ahead gives you right. something, right? Right. I, there are certainly, there are so many women in broadcast now 
fewer women on the business side, though right. I do work with a lot of extremely talented women. Maria Bartiromo, of course, is the, the marquee name in the business, and I think anyone would do well to have a tiny piece of what she's been able to accomplish in the business. Also, my former colleague Erin Burnett, who was just, I mean, she was a force to be reckoned with at CNBC. She was the first person to travel to the Middle East and figure out the importance of sovereign wealth funds and right. go to Africa and figure out how companies like Siemens and uh, GE were trying to build infrastructure there. So she was really at the cutting edge of a lot of those stories and wasn't afraid to say, hey, I'll sleep on the floor of this factory because there aren't any hotels there just to be able to get this story and to be able to do that and still look flawless on air. I'm not sure really ever how she did it, but she did it nonetheless. Um, I think people like Peggy Noonan uh, are also extremely, extremely um, important people in our landscape because she is a thought leader. She's more than just a public figure. Of course, she was a speechwriter for a very long time. She now has a column in the Wall Street Journal, which if you read it on Sundays, um, it has upwards of a thousand comments on it every single week. I mean, people read her religiously. She's on every every show. She's on every Sunday show. And she is, you know, if you can book Peggy Noonan as a commentator on a conservative issue, she's the person that you go to. But regardless of politics, she is a person who has really been able to drive discussion and drive conversation and figure out the multi-platform um, aspect of being a journalist and getting your, your thoughts out there. Um, I would say those three people are definitely people that I would aspire to be like. And just one little quote here. Um, I forgot to give the hashtag. For all of you who are in the room or who are watching it streamed, it's uh, hashtag Tausche UNC because we always do get some Twitter things. Mm -hmm. um, Alex. Um, well, I just would like to ask you, as a college student myself, even though I'm a, jun a junior and won't be graduating for another year, what advice do you have for the students that are going to be throwing themselves into the workforce at the, in such hard economic times and being a woman also in the journalism field? It's, it's tough, and you won't like the assignments that you get. You get a lot of assignments that um, are undesirable, to say the least, and you think, God, I can't believe I spent four years at a flagship journalism school and I'm, you know, chasing this story about a landfill somewhere. You know, it's it, it, it's whatever, insert whatever story here. I would feel that way sort of about a hurricane when I covered Hurricane Sandy. The joke in the office was when they came up to give out the assignment, everyone ran to the bathroom and stood on the toilet so you can see the feet because you're like, no, I don't want to go with a hurricane. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the conversation. You have to do it. And you're not always going to like the stories that you do. You're not always going to like the way that they're given to you or the, the type of, of production you're going to have to do on them. But you do it. And that's what gets you noticed is taking the stories that are uninteresting, that from the face of it mean nothing, doing great work, making them mean something, finding an angle on it, finding a person to talk to that your editor or your manager never even thought about. You know, there's always, that's, that's your job to be able to do that, and that's your opportunity to be able to find that that ray of light in that story to be able to make a difference and to make that, that story mean something a little bit more. I remember when I took my first job, the company was called Deal Reporter at the Financial Times, and for all my reporting experience in Brussels, uh, here at the journalism school, I did not know how to make a phone call. I mean, I, I, could, I could make a phone call. I had ordered pizzas, I, you know, I called my boyfriend, and you know, I knew how to make a phone call, but I didn't know how to make a phone call that would get returned. And I thought, well, you know, I've worked in Brussels. I've interviewed Tony Blair. I've interviewed Jack Chirac. I know everything there is to know about this. But most of my reporting in Brussels was in person. You go to these conferences. You go to summits. You see them walking around. You go up, shake your hand, introduce them. And you, know, you sort of ask them a question on the fly. And that's how you get your story. But you have to figure out how to get people to talk to you. And when I started, it was right as the financial crisis was snowballing. It was the fall of 2008. And I would call people and say things like, you know, my memory's fuzzy, but I'd say things like, you know, I know you probably don't want to talk to me, <laughs> but I have to do this story. And, you know, just please call me back. And finally, my coworker said, how many people have called you back? And I said, well, you know, a few, a few. And he said, no one has called you back, not a single person. You are doing this completely the wrong way. You want to make what you're doing sound interesting. If you're not interested in it, 
and this guy at this Wall Street firm could potentially get fired for even talking to you or picking up your phone call, why in the world would he call you back? So I went through, you know, with my colleague who is still a dear friend, and he said, all right, call me on the phone. Pretend I'm a potential source. Pretend this is off the record. And we had these fake phone conversations. We probably did 10 or 20 before. He even let me take my training wheels off and actually make my own phone calls. And it was the crisis. No one wanted to talk to you. Everyone's firm was blowing up. No one knew what their stock was worth, if they were going to have a job when they woke up in the morning. Why in the world, when their lives are falling apart, would they answer a call from a journalist? It made your life impossible. So only by figuring out how to talk to people and by talking to them as a human and saying, hey, listen, I'm covering this story. I can't write it without your help because I really want to make sure that we get this accurate and we get it right. I'm happy to talk to you off the record. Um, but, you know, I have a few details. It wouldn't be right if I went out with these details before talking to you. Give me a call back. 100% of the time they'll call you back because they don't want something out there that's not going to make them look good or that's not going to get the story right and potentially come back to bite them at the end of the day. There was a situation shortly after that where um, you, you get hung up on all the time, all the time. And at first I was like, oh man, maybe I'm not cut out for this because everyone's hanging up on me. And then one day I just said, you know what, forget them. I picked up the phone and called the guy back and said, hey, I'm not sure if that was your line or mine. My phone's been really spotty. And he said, no, I don't want to talk to you. I hate journalists. Get out of my phone. And I said, okay. So then I hung up again. A week later, I called him back and left him a message and said, hey, this is Kayla Tausche again. I'm willing to, I'm willing to forgive what happened between us last week. So I, just, I just really need to get this story. And he called me back and he said, wow, doesn't hurt to try. It doesn't hurt to try. I tried him 20 times before... I actually got him to talk to me. He still remains a great friend, great source. And you just got to keep going, keep plugging. No matter how many people hang up on you or how many resumes you dump that don't end in interviews, you'll get there. Tell them about texting. I did find that interesting last night. Oh, well. Over the phone, texts. Well, I, I was telling them last night that um, I do a lot of my reporting by text now. And it's just the nature of, of feeding the beast. Now your deadlines are getting shorter and shorter. You have to do things on all platforms, and you want to break the story, and then you want to do a segment about it, and then you want to tweet about it. You know, it's just sort of all coming at you at once. And um, email is great, but many times people don't want a paper trail. They don't want their company to see that they've been, you know, keeping up cahoots with a journalist that is going to in turn write a story about the company. That always looks fishy. Um, and then sometimes you can't get people on the phone. You call them, their secretary picks up, they send them a message that you called, and maybe they're on a flight, maybe they're um, you know, in a meeting or something. But So I've taken to, in meetings, asking people for um, the best cell phone number to reach them because everyone's always on the road. No one's really ever at their desk these days. We're all, all over the place. And just shooting them a note and saying, hey, have a couple details that I'm going to run out with in the next hour. Can you, can you give me a quick call or can I text them to you? And you always ask permission, but if you then text them and they're open to doing the dialogue that way, that's been the, the single most helpful way for me to do my recordings by text. And you only get texts by subpoena. I was wondering about um, the whole assert a little backtrack here about the assertiveness and um, men and getting people to take you seriously. I have brothers, so I've never really had a problem. And I think so for some people, it comes more naturally than others. I wonder if it does it come naturally for you or did you have to learn like with the phone call thing, learn that you have to be learn from from being turned down or maybe not being taken serious that wait a minute, I have to be a more assertive or I have to take my stand. You, you learn by experience if you don't have it already. For those people who already have that assertiveness already, more power to you. Yeah. Use it, harness it, do whatever you need to do. More power to you. I certainly didn't have that. I had an older brother, um, but we were a few years apart in age. We were into very different things, and um, you know, for whatever reason, maybe he was just nice to me. I didn't really have to stand up to him that much. <laughs> um, but I found that I did need to figure out exactly... You just need to figure out, I, I hate to say figure out your brand because that sounds so trite and it just sounds so robotic, but what type of person do you want to be? What type of person do you want to be known for? Do you want to be known for the hard-charging bull who's going to be really rude and leave them a voicemail where you're just saying, I can't believe, you know, uh, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Figure out how exactly you want to go about the situation, but then, you know, it really takes time to figure out in what situations do I need to assert myself? When will 
I be okay to step back and say, this will go my way? And when do I really need to step up and assert myself? And um, this happened even recently. I'm still trying to figure this out. Um, last summer, um, one of my producers said, we're doing this series on veterans in Wall Street and how Wall Street's hiring veterans. And you're going to do a sit-down interview with Gary Cohn, who's the president of Goldman Sachs. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. And it was supposed to be an exclusive. And uh, the producers had sort of figured out exactly what was going to go down. They figured out all the logistics. And we were going to talk about Goldman Sachs' veterans program. And I went in there. We had about a 30-minute sit-down, a little bit of banter, and then a lot of talk about veterans. And then I wanted to ask a lot of questions about hiring and Wall Street and the European debt crisis and a few other a few other topics and you know they didn't love that I wasn't staying just on the veterans issue but you know you have the president of Goldman Sachs sitting right in front of you all right I'm gonna ask a couple questions about the economy and they, they didn't love um, where they felt like the interview was going so the next day our interview was taped and it was gonna run on Thursday Tuesday to Thursday and on Wednesday morning they had this executive hosting a show on Bloomberg News. And this was when it had been billed to us as an exclusive, and it was clear that because you know we didn't give them the veterans softball piece that they wanted, that they were going to go put their executive elsewhere. So that, of course, was a huge crushing blow. And I think, OK, well, that was a, a really lost opportunity, even though I got kudos for not sticking to the right line of questioning. I run into this executive at a dinner party, and he said, oh, really, you? I thought I was never going to see you again. And I said, well, here I am. Remember when you, when you gave that interview away after you told me it was going to be exclusive? And he said, well, here's the thing. By the time you matter, I won't. <gasps> and I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> if he wasn't seven feet tall, I would have ripped his head off. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well, this will, karma, karma will get back to you. So it, things like that happen. People are not always going to be nice to you. But you got to figure out what you're going to do about it, how you're going to be, and, you know, that's just, keep it that's just it's, it's never going to end. It's always going to happen. But you take it in stride. You fix it the next time. You prepared for that, Alex? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> no, speaking of that, um, you know, overcoming your struggles, have you ever had minor struggles on camera, such as a technical difficulty, a microphone mm -hmm. not working? And how do you overcome those? Um, live TV, there's really nothing like it because you just have to be willing to put yourself out there, whether it makes you look like an idiot, whether, you know, you get caught with five extra minutes that you have to fill and then you have to find something smart to say during those five extra minutes. I've had a lot of interesting things happen on camera. Um, last summer I was in London covering the News Corp phone hacking scandal mm -hmm. and we were reporting that story of the day was that a lot of the um, senior police chiefs were stepping down because they were found to have been accepting mm -hmm. bribes from the newspapers to give them information and place stories. So we were outside of Scotland Yard. For those of you who are familiar with London, it's not really a great part of the city. And we were there until very late because of the time difference. And there was this homeless man who kept wandering into each of the, um, each of the live shots of the few journalists that were there. And there was one situation where I went on camera. I was dry. I was fine. And I was talking. And then I threw to a couple sound bites. And I had some graphics come up. And luckily, I was not on air, but this homeless man came up and he poured a flask of bourbon or whiskey or scotch or whatever it was <laughs> on my head. So I start the segment dry, and then I'm talking, and there's some video playing, and there's some graphics covering me. And then I come back on camera, and I'm soaking wet. <laughs> and I'm sticky, and I'm smiling, and I'm just trying to, you know, get this over with as soon as possible. And you can tell the anchor's face is like, <laughs> it's not raining. <laughs> it's just happened. Um, so that, of course, was hysterical. There was another time when I was um, reporting from uh, the halls of Congress, and a staffer walked right in front of me while I was on camera. 
got caught up in my microphone cord <laughs> and pulled me down to the ground <laughs> while I was live on camera. And then I thought that they were going to cut cut away from the shot, but they left it up with just nothing there. And then I stood back up <laughs> and then started to talk again, but I didn't have a microphone on, so then I, I just I quit while I was ahead. Um, so it, stuff like that happens all the time, all the time. Um, can we see these moments on YouTube? <laughs> you, you, can see, you can see that one. It's definitely <laughs> on YouTube. Um, the bourbon one, I think it's I think it's on CNBC's website somewhere, but luckily people weren't really able to pick up on what happened, so it didn't... Did you not explain what happened? They just <laughs> left them wondering why you were... Yeah, I just wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. I was like, all right, not, not even addressing it, just going to say goodbye. Um, and then things happen all the time, though. You write a script... You put it in the teleprompter. Teleprompter is not working, so you just ad lib it. Um, you are supposed to have a 60 second segment. They end up having a guest cancel and they say, Can you just chat with the anchors for an additional five minutes? And then you have to say, Sure, that's fine. Um, you have to do your homework, don't you? You do. You do. And I read everything I can get my hands on. And I think that that's also a way to to establish yourself. You never find yourself in a meeting where someone asks you a question, even if it's just small talk about something random that's happening in uh, in the economy or in current events. Um, and if you can if you can hold a conversation like that, then people will take you seriously. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to follow up on that, Kayla. I was just getting ready to ask you the same thing about homework. And one of the things I talk about in leadership is that if you're going to be a leader, the first the first building block is you have to have credibility. So uh, there's so much to know in business. How do you, how do you prepare for? How, well, I mean, what do you do typically to prepare beyond reading, right? Mm -hmm. And what skills do you wish you had that you can see yourself going back to school to get or to continue? Because life is really about continuous learning. So right. So, so what is it you? would like to really, if you went back to school, what you would really like to study more about and that's come out over the time you've been there? Yeah, I, I read um, in the morning, first thing I read, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times business section. Um, I also check Twitter, one of the very first things I do. And if I have, say, 10 or 15 stocks that I'm watching, I'll look at what they did either in overnight trading or um, early markets trading, and then I'll also look at the what Twitter calls a cash tag, where you have the stock market symbol, but you have a dollar sign in front of it, and it's sort of a, a tag for this company, and I'll, I'll search those on Twitter, too, to make sure that I know everything about what everyone's saying about a specific company that I'm covering, or um, what have you. So that is sort of the first line of defense in the morning. And then, you know, uh, we have a lot of um, great markets people at CNBC on staff who crunch numbers for us overnight and they'll send you know a morning read email, a primer email, here's what the numbers look like email, so you just sort of read all the emails that come in and, and you just watch the markets. And I think that if I were to go back to school, I would love to go to business school, but a I don't... A joint degree, a joint degree. <laughs> well, I, well, I'd love to get, get, to get an MBA, um, but the problem is I'm doing exactly what I want to do, so why would I go back to school and take two years out from my dream career just to you know to dive back into the books oh it would be amazing but I would feel like I would be cheating myself out of opportunities that I could get in the field by going back to school that being said everyone raves about how wonderful business school specifically is for networking um, networking you hear this as a buzzword all the time but it's really about relationships it's not about having superficial conversations over coffee and exchanging resumes and right this person knows I exist it's really <coughs> figuring out what makes this person tick? How? What can I do for them? And what can they do for me? And how will we have a symbiotic relationship in this industry or beyond going forward? Um, and in business school, you make a lot of friendships. You travel a lot. You, you know, and and I say that because I feel like I've learned the journalism things that I need for the most part on the job at, at CNBC and at NBC. Um, but I would love to learn more of the nuts and bolts on accounting and entrepreneurship and, and meeting those people and just getting to, getting to have access to people who are going to be the next generation of business leaders and of thought leaders and being able to tap into that market. Because the other way that you prepare is, you know, I shoot notes first thing in the morning to anywhere between 30 and 40 traders to say, what are you watching? What's going to move the market today? What should we be talking about? And 
I have thankfully met those people over the years of my career, but the more people that you know and the wider your network is, the better anyone can do their job because you are you were able to access such a larger wealth of information. Yeah, I think you make a really important point, and it's, it's knowing when to go back to school. So mm -hmm. I went to business school in my mid-30s, after you have your career established, mm -hmm. and went back and got an MBA at Columbia because they had a fellowship for mid-career journalists. Mm -hmm. But I think you make a, a, an, also an excellent point, too. It's not only about learning all the, the, the ins and outs of accounting, finance, and marketing that you get in business school. It's really the contacts that you get for a journalist that are invaluable because right. you are really in school with future CEOs, CMOs, all the people that you need to be able to get right. into. And, and they can point you to yeah. what you need to know too. I mean, that is the, if there are any shortcuts in business or in journalism, if there are any shortcuts, it's people. It would take me, if I were looking at a balance sheet, it would take, or, or a 10K, which is a company's annual filing. These things can be hundreds of pages long and you know they're not exactly your bedtime reading so it would take you hours to make your way through the entire thing but if you know the right people and if you know an analyst or an investor or someone who's already done that work and you can ping them and say what's important in this what do you think actually matters and they'll say well there's this one clause or this one line that people are going to make a really big deal about that's not information that that I just have or that is available to the naked eye. It's something that someone can point you to because they already know what's important about that. And I, I know you're saying networking is very important, you know, in terms of making relationships with people so you can even get the job that you want in the first place. What other qualities should women like us in college try to, you know, have now before we graduate and when we're trying to go into this field? What should we really snag on to, you know, should it be professionalism, should it be being persistent when you talk to, you know, your sources, what what would you give advice? To? I would say all of the above, <laughs> of course. Um, you know, any great adjective, of course, would be a wonderful thing. I think the most important thing as a journalist, male or female, is to be curious because only by being curious, by asking the follow-up question by saying something's not exactly right about that I'm going to dig a little further can you actually do can you actually commit news and commit journalism when when a story is breaking or when something is happening um, people don't tell you directly they don't say hey you need to know this you have to find it in a roundabout way so it's by asking the the follow-up questions and by figuring out where uh, I, I'm not a hockey fan, but I am told this is a Wayne Gretzky quote, um, where you skate to where the puck is going to be, yeah. not where the puck is. Am I right, Chris? Yes. Am I right? <laughs> okay. It's a good quote. All right. Um, so skate to where the puck is going to be, and if you're curious, you will automatically gravitate toward doing that. So I would say curiosity, professionalism, and also um, humility, knowing your boundaries, knowing when you can ask for something, when you can't. Um, understanding that no job is the perfect job, um, no job is too small, no job is, your first job is not your last job, and everything can teach you something. I think that when I started in the field, I, as I said before, I was in this, you know, office where the lights are going out, I was like, I'm going <laughs> to die here, no one's going to read what I write, um, but that's not the case. If you're curious, if you push the envelope, if you figure out how to make something work for you. Any job can work and any job can be life-changing. And um, you just need to be persistent, keep on with it. What was your job search like when you first started out? Do we want to go there? <laughs> <laughs> um, Must have not been easy. It was brutal, actually. It was absolutely brutal. And it is a little bit, it's laughable now, and it, I feel so blessed to be able to reflect on it now and laugh, but, um, at the time, I had worked at Bloomberg for a summer, and I thought, since I know currencies from my time in Brussels, and I know the Bloomberg terminal from having worked at Bloomberg, I thought that I was going to try my hand in finance. But unfortunately, I was doing that at exactly the wrong time. It was the spring of 2008, and I had um, signed up for an internship with an investment bank that two months later went belly up, did not exist anymore. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I can't plan for this. Maybe. I will just have to wait it out, sit on my hands, go to New York. I knew I wanted to live in New York because at the time I wanted to be a reporter and looking at um, all the websites, Media Bistro, JournalismJobs.com, the UNC Career Services website, 
for all the jobs in business journalism at the time, they were all in New York City. And I remember moving up there, searching for a job, and my mom saying, well, you know, it's okay. You only have a summer lease. I had a three-month lease at this um, interesting apartment in Hell's <laughs> Kitchen that I shared with a colleague from the journalism school here. We, we both laugh about this now. Um, and my mom said, well, you only have a summer lease. If you don't get a job, you can just move home to Atlanta. And I thought, I haven't seen a single job in Atlanta in my industry. If I move back to Atlanta, I'll be waiting tables. So that was really what made me think, okay, I gotta hit the ground running. I really need to, um, to do everything I can. I probably, um, I probably sent my resume to 200 places, 300 places. I mean, it was in the hundreds for sure. And I took writing tests a lot of places, but at that time and at that point in the economy, which is unfortunately for journalism not all that different from where we are now, there just there weren't that many openings, especially for a company to take a gamble on a young person, which I soon found. And um, back then, the New York Times had this number. Their phone number was 1111111. It was famously <laughs> called the nine ones. So if the New York Times ever called you, you knew it because it would show up on your on your phone, and you think, wow, this is a marketing scam. But it was in fact the New York Times, and that was a long historical thing that has since gone away. But I remember having sent my resume to the New York Times, to the Financial Times, to the Wall Street Journal, to all the big um, flagship outlets. And I was at a dinner party and I got a call from the nine ones. And I thought, this is it. This is my chance. I'm going to be a reporter for the New York Times. They're calling me. And so I stepped down and I took the call and they said, we think your story is really compelling. We'd love to have you by for an interview. Um, this, this, and this. And I said, well, great. When should we do it? How many writing samples should I bring? And they said, what do you mean writing samples? And I said, well, you know, articles that I've written in my portfolio, just things that I can show you about stuff that I've done. And they said, do you think we're interviewing you for a job? And I said, yeah. And they said, oh, your friend so-and-so passed your name along. We're writing an article about young people who are unemployed in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd love to interview you for this article. <laughs> and I thought, it cannot get worse. <laughs> it cannot get worse than that. I immediately called that friend and berated them <laughs> and thought, really? I thought they were interviewing me for a job, and it certainly did not happen that way. That seems like another moment where you just kind of roll with the punches and get back up. <laughs> and <laughs> persistence. You yes. can't really do much other than that, um, unfortunately. But so it turned out that in my interview at the Financial Times, they said, well, we are actually laying off people at the broadsheet. We're not expanding at this time, but we do have these um, niche investor newsletters where we are investing and where we are seeing big revenue growth and where we do think that there are going to be a lot of opportunities going forward. And I said, done, done, sign me up, done. <laughs> um, so it took me about six weeks from moving to New York to actually reporting for duty and, and showing up for work, which I didn't think was, was all that bad, but I mean, I was hitting the pavement every single day. I had a very strict routine up at 6.30, out the door by 7. You know, I was in my business clothes. I'd go to like an internet cafe or a Kinko's and I would work in Midtown so that if I got a call from someone and they said, we'll meet with you in 30 minutes, I was already five blocks away and I could go there. And I had all my papers right there because I was, <laughs> my office was Kinko's. <laughs> so, um, so that worked out and it was sort of miraculous. And my parents were like, wow. How did that happen? <laughs> um, but it was all good, and my friend and I eventually moved into a legitimate apartment um, in the village, and we had a dishwasher, and we had you know, a front door. We had all these things that we needed in our lives. So you know, we grew up, and, and we still laugh about, about those days. And I was telling Dean King last night, she had a job at Edelman. Um, she was working there for the summer. It paid $10 an hour. And so we both were not living large by any means, and I would make her lunch and send her off in the morning, and we sort of took care of each other that way because I was a stay-at-home friend and she was the working friend. <laughs> and, and so I picked up her laundry and I picked up her dry cleaning and I you know, let the cable guy in, and, and she would go off and win the bread and then buy my dinner. And they're still great <laughs> friends, which is an important yes. part of it. Last night we were talking about the same thing in all the interviews, and I asked you about if you ever turn anything down. 
because it, I, you said no job is too small, but mm -hmm. you talked about turning turning things down. And I wanted to take it a, a step further. And if you if you feel like there was anything you did on your way up that you felt like you could have done without, if not regret it, but wish you had turned it down and taken something else, if it was a waste. In well, I think if you ask me that in a decade, there probably will be many things. At this point, I've only had two jobs ever. I worked at um, deal reporter at the FT in New York, and then I worked as an editor in London for about a year, and then I went right to CNBC. So at this point, I haven't really had opportunities, so to speak, to turn down. I've had two wonderful opportunities, one smaller one, one bigger one, and they're very different and very exciting in their own right, and um, I haven't had the opportunity to turn something down since then. So the, the, you were talking about Kenya? Yes. Mm -hmm. So over the course of those 200 some uh, resume drops and dozens of interviews. Um, I went back to Bloomberg News where I had interned the summer before and um, they pretty much create their intern class right after the summer ends. They figure out who they're, you know, call it 30 interns or returning uh, news people are going to be the following year. And because I, I hadn't chosen to do that and didn't express an, uh, an interest in doing that, um, they didn't necessarily have room for me in New York at the time, and they were also laying off people at the time. So I went back and said, you know, is there anything I'd love to move abroad again? Do you have anything in any of your other bureaus? And they said, well, we are looking for someone to cover the oil market, to cover crude oil in Nairobi, in Kenya. And I would pay to, ha to now see what the look on my face looked like when that was proposed <laughs> to me, because at the time, Kenya was in civil war, all study abroad trips, all safaris, everything had been canceled because it was so dangerous there. And that was a very easy opportunity to turn down because even though Bloomberg was such a reputable news organization and I wanted to move abroad, I just didn't feel like it was safe and I didn't feel like the way that the job was proposed to me was something where I would feel secure or I would feel protected because it was just sort of an afterthought like, oh, you could go to Kenya, we could send you to Nairobi. And I was like, and I'll die? <laughs> really? Um, and since then, I've had a laugh with um, a, a senior guy at Bloomberg about that. And he said, yeah, you know, we, we did run into the is some issues with the person that we ended up sending there. So you are probably better off for, for not having done that. So, so people from the 11 o'clock classes are, are, I can see, getting up. But I want to make sure I get out to the audience. So um, the question, yes, tell us your name. Um, Emily Freeman. Um, my question is, you said you graduated in 2008, correct? Mm -hmm. Do you think that, in a way, the financial meltdown of the 2008-2009 almost catapulted your career as a business journalist? I feel like there was so much to write about and so much going on that it could have been almost helpful for business journalism. There was. Um, there was so much going on, but at the same time, the heyday of 05, 06, 07, I'm told from my colleagues and from people that, that I've worked with throughout the years, that, that was sort of the the glory day that it was easier to report then because there were so many deals happening there was so much stuff that was questionable that was going on before the crisis but yet people on Wall Street and in business were really proud of it the giant deal that they had just closed this bundle of mortgages that they were offloading and listen to this and people were really interested in talking about it when the crisis happened all of a sudden, people went radio silent, and they sort of turned inward and said, I got to figure out how to shore up my balance sheet or how to get my company on the right footing again. I got to not worry about interacting with the media, and I need to worry instead about actually making sure that we survive this. So yes, there was a lot to write about, certainly from CNBC's perspective. I don't think ever in the history of CNBC, more people watched that channel than during the financial crisis. But it was a period that was very difficult to report and report accurately because of uh, the focus shifting um, on a very inward level to um, to not pick up the phone, to not answer those phone calls. So, um, so it, it was a little bit difficult. And then from January 2009 until, call it um, May 2010, there's really nothing going on in the market. It was like a barren wasteland. Um, a lot of companies were going bankrupt. The stock market was at near or at record lows. Um, no companies were transacting. No one was really doing anything. Everyone was sitting on their hands. People were pulling their money out of the market and putting it under their mattresses. And while that's a story in and of itself, it doesn't really lend itself well to, to writing or reporting. Um, so when 
I was able to break the story that Kraft was buying Cadbury, it was sort of a perfect storm because if there had been 20 deals of that kind happening at the same time, no one probably would have noticed the story that I broke. But because it happened at a time where nothing else was going on, um, it stood out. And so I do think that that was what helped my career and was able to catapult it because it was just so barren out there. And here I was at 23 trying to say that there was going to be a $20 billion deal where macaroni and chocolate was merging. <laughs> and that was, that was interesting to people. Another question. Right there. Um, Carol Gay, who's a graduate of Master Turkey here. Um, I was wondering about the moment where you had kind of the head scratching reaction to the 16 year old on camera that um, CNBC had asked for. Um, do you feel that there are any barriers, either because of your youth or your gender, to kind of um, being taken professionally and being taken seriously um, in the profession that you've chosen? And how have you navigated that? Well, I have to say, I was incredibly impressed by her. I don't know how you took away that interview, but here was this 16-year-old actress. I believe she um, had played... I was referring to you. Yeah, when you oh. said you were 16, oh, when, when I you said started. 16. Oh, yeah. we had a guest on CNBC literally two weeks ago who was a 16-year-old <laughs> stock trader who used to be a child on Desperate oh. Housewives for seven years. I thought you were referring to that. I was like, you watched that? <laughs> cool. <laughs> Power to you. Um, no, when I... I took it in stride, and I would watch myself on camera and think, I do look young. I can't believe they're still letting me do this. And back then, I had brown hair that was down to here, as I did in college. And you know, since then, I've decided maybe it would be more professional to not have you know the beach bum surfer hair and cut it off. And um, but yeah, I did. I did feel young, but at the time, there was no one who knew more about that story than I did because I broke it. I was covering it. I had the first lead. I had every single lead um, from then on. So I never, I always felt like I was in a position of leverage when I was on the other side of the camera. There was nothing that I ever felt like an anchor or a correspondent could ask me that would have been a curveball because after all, it was my story. And I think being able to convey that and convey that I was actually in a position of knowledge, not you, if they said, but don't you think this? And I would say, no, I don't think that. Um, so as long as you do your homework and you have all the information and you are the person who is in the position of relative knowledge, I think that it is, um, it is definitely easier to be able to communicate that. And people still now at CNBC look at me and say, you are a child. You know? <laughs> I get jokes on air even about, do I, I use I a fake ID? And I'm I like, all right. <laughs> I want to follow up on one point that you have, because when I was looking up some information about you, there was also comments after the YouTube that you had been on the... Today Show, you had a great story on the Today Show, and the comments after was, gee, it's nice to see she's got such great legs. Mm. There were like three guys who sort of came on in the comments. So, really? Mm -hmm. There's a YouTube video that's actually titled, Kayla Tosh, she has great legs. And I, and I, was, and I put was that the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got me. <laughs> Um, but I mean, so that there are some things that you're a very attractive young woman, you know, do you, do you talk about it? You just deal with it? I mean, yeah, I think that you have to deal with it. You have to just take it in stride like everything else. Um, I don't think that any woman who is in media, who is willing to be a public figure and put themselves out there, thinks that they will get away with not having that. Um, certainly no or few men or male anchors, correspondents. I've never seen YouTubes that say, you know, Jim Cramer, great bald spot, you know. <laughs> or you know, ugly. Or, <laughs> I love Jim, he's a dear friend. But, um, but you know, you don't really see the same type of attention to, to the men on the side of the business. And I, you know, you have to take it as a compliment. It is a fantastic compliment that, all right, some people will watch and they will listen to what you're saying and they do think that your reports have substance. Other people watch because they think you're hot. They're still watching. You know, they still, and, you know, I, I certainly like the former better than the latter viewers, but, you know, you sort of, you take them as they come. You can't really escape it. And you know at the end of the day that the value that you bring to the network or to, or to your employer is not as a an attractive person. It's as a reporter, and it's as someone who has a good brain. I'm going to go to the professor for the final, <coughs> that's you, Penny, <laughs> to sort of summarize this, because I feel like we're hearing a lot of elements that are all about leadership, you yes. know, and, and so I'm going to... No, go. Well, thank you. I was actually thinking about that. Um, 
I think that it, uh, Kayla has touched on several themes here that I think are really important, uh, if you're, especially if you're a woman and want to show leadership. One is to uh, constantly um, make sure you've done your homework, that you, uh, and, and what I tell everyone in leadership, you need to spend 30 minutes every day just reading for yourself. Uh, that is the single best thing you can do to stay informed because credibility is, is uh, the first building block of leadership. I think the second thing you've talked about is just kind of knowing what you want to do and going for it, knowing there's going to be all sorts of noise in the background and it's what you hear and, re and, and want to hear mm -hmm. that you reflect back that's really important. And then I think the third thing you hit on which uh, is really, really important is about networking. It really, and networking is just not going out and handing out the cards as you said. Mm -hmm. It's about getting to know people, getting to understand what makes them tick, understanding how they can perhaps help you. Because mm -hmm. I will, I will say it is it, it is amazing how many times somebody can point you at the the line that you need to be focused on, or say I can't help you, but someone else can. So it, mm -hmm. especially in journalism, it's about knowing who to go to to get the facts right and get the story right. And you can never know enough people. Um, and I, I always say that, and I don't mean it's it's it is quality of network over quantity. But at the same time, no one that you meet is not for a reason. And I say that because in the course of my interviews, when I interviewed at the Wall Street Journal, I interviewed with an editor named Dennis Berman. I also interviewed at Barron's um, with a senior writer named Mike Santoli. Mike Santoli is now um, working at CNBC with me, and Dennis Berman co-anchored a morning show with me on CNBC last summer. And so he and I had to spend three hours together on air. And luckily, those are both people who I've not only established great relationships with, but stayed in touch with them. Because you just never know when you're going to run into people on the other side of the tracks or on the other side of the business. Because it is a very small world out there. And if you create these quality relationships with people, you can learn something from them, and you'll probably run into them again. Um, the other thing that I would say is, I know that we've been discussing Sheryl Sandberg, the COO at Facebook, has a book coming out about women and leadership and the way that you position yourselves in, in your career. I actually had the opportunity to talk to her a little bit about this at a conference that I was moderating in California in November. And the piece of advice that she had for me was, it gets better when you're 30. In your 20s, you just have to prove yourself. You just have to keep your head down, keep your pencil sharpened. You just have to prove yourself. When you're 30, you can walk into any room and people will automatically take you more seriously because you have a three in front of your age. So that's my motivation. <laughs> getting to 30. I know it's a little bit unorthodox to want to be older, but I want to be 30. Well, I thank you for giving us your time. And the one thing that I find about Kayla is she's also a give back person. Not only is she persistent in her career, but she's a member of the JAFA board. So she's constantly giving back to that school and has been already in two classes this morning as well as with us and going to do some more. So I just want to say thank you. Um, Thank you for having and me. And go Tar Heels. Mm -hmm. And uh, may the economy improve yes. for all of our grads. Yes. Thanks so much. And thank you. For your